them son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And now the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Please remain standing. Please take your hymnals and turn to page 88. Hymn number 88, I sing the power, the mighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command, and all the stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed Where I turn my eye If I survey the ground I tread Or gaze upon the sky There's not a plant or flower below But make thy glory Known. And clouds arise, a tempest blow, but order from thy throne. Creatures that borrow life from thee are subject to thy care. There's not a place where we can flee, but God is present. There. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. All right. Good morning, church. My name is Kendall Herndon. I am here to welcome you. I have a poem that I like to share with you. God has never sent you into a situation alone. God does. God goes before you. He stands beside you. He walks behind you. Whatever situation you have right now, be confident God is with you. Amen. On behalf of our pastor, Ben Arte, the elders, and the 
entire Glenville Present Truth family, we welcome you. Please come again. Uh, most of our, your announcements are, are in the bulletin, but I do have one announcement from the Northern Ohio Women Ministry presents a Bloom Scholarship Tea chosen and positioned to impact. Will be held May the 5th, 2024 from 2 p.m. at 5 p.m. at the Mediterranean on 25021 Rockside Road, Bedford, Ohio, May the 5th. Anyone interested, please let me know. Thank you. See you all smiling faces out there. That 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 loud enough? Can everybody hear me? God is good. I give you greeting from our pastor, Pastor Ben Orote. Him and me, we had prayer yesterday, and he sends his not only his prayer, but also his best wishes for you and your families. So that God be the glory. We want to. Uh, as, as you look into your bulletins, we see that we have some things coming up. And we want to remember uh, our dear Alice. She's got to have a, some trio. And this will be April the 6th. And the music will be accustomed to very pleasant for this sanctuary. So we look forward to that. Uh, Alice and your trio of friends. Uh, Sabbath, the 20th, is a big day because we're going to have baptism. Amen. Oh, that was just a few. We're going to have baptism. Amen. You know, I hope that we all are working with someone to, uh, that they may enter the watery grave. So remember each of our candidates as they are studying and praying to be ready to go down into the watery grave. Praise God. And also something coming up on the 20th, our speaker will be Dr. Next Amalo. Matter of fact, that person is a, uh, uh, a marriage counselor, also to teach relationships and uh, just emphasis on marriage. So it's not only for those that are married, but also for those that are single. It's about relationships. And we know that the devil is after the marriage. Yes. And so we want to be praying for this big day coming up. There will be a, a, a dinner served, served by our dear um, um, the 20th. And we want to just look for a high day in Zion. God bless you and may God keep you as we continue the rest of the service. God bless you. At this time, I plead we have a children's story. Precious in his sight, Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Can I um, get everyone's name? I know two, but we have a new friend. Let's start. 
Anna. We have Anna. Kendall. Kendall. <laughs> Michael. Welcome, Michael. Welcome to Children's Story. How was your week? You had a good week? I'm glad to hear that. Well, today we're going to continue looking at the Ten Commandments. Remember last time we talked about how we can honor our father and our mother. We respect them because God has put them over our lives. Well, I want to continue talking about the Ten Commandments, but first, let's, I want us to think, which commandments have we definitely not broken? Okay, so I'm just going to go through a couple commandments and raise your hand if you can say, I have kept that commandment perfectly, okay? Okay, so the first commandment says that, um, one of the commandments says that we are to remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Have you kept the Sabbath day holy all the days of your life? Can you raise your hand on that? You've kept it holy all your life? Good job. I'm still working on it. What about um, not having any other gods before him? Do you put anything else in front of God? Have you perfectly kept that commandment? You have studied your Bible instead of watching your favorite show when you know you're supposed to, you, or you should be, you know, praying or studying. What about honoring your parents, obeying, respecting them? Have you kept that perfectly? You've always obeyed and respect, respected your parents. Oh, my goodness. I need to get more like you guys. Well, last one. How about murder? Has anyone murdered? Have you kept that one perfectly so far? You can raise your hand. Raise it high. You've never murdered any, anybody, Anna? Uh -uh. You've never murdered anybody? OK. Can you think of any stories in the Bible about murder? Give me one. When Moses killed the Egyptian. Moses killing the Egyptian. Any others? When they stuck uh, Jesus on the cross. Jesus, the ultimate murder, right? But he didn't stay dead, right? Good job. Um, any others? Um, was it Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. Is there any others? How about David killing Uriah? Yeah, there's, or Stephen in the Bible. There's lots of stories about murder in the Bible. Well, today I'm going to tell you a story about murder. It's a little bit different. And tell me what you think about it afterwards. So there was a little boy named Timmy, and Timmy was in the fourth grade. And Timmy was super smart. He wasn't just smart. He was like the biggest. He was a great athlete. Everybody looked up to Timmy. Timmy got all of the answers right on all of his tests. People were jealous of Timmy. Timmy was super smart, and his classmates knew it. His teachers knew it, and Timmy knew it. But one day, there was a girl who came to school. Her name was Sarah Beth, and Sarah was a new student. And one day, there was a spelling test. And Timmy got a great score. He got a 98%. That's an A, right? He got a 98%. But Sarah got 100%. OK, Timmy thought, OK, it's just one test. Next, they had a math test. How many people like math? Like math? No, not too much. OK. Well, Timmy got a 98% again. Sarah got 102%. How is that even possible? Well, she got the extra credit right also. So Timmy's like scratching his head. Now his uh, peers, his classmates are looking at him like, Timmy, what's going on? You're supposed to be the smartest one in the class. You're not going to let some girl come in and beat you. Well, Timmy's starting to get a little anxious, but you know. Next, we have his favorite subject, science. There's no way she's going to beat him in science. Timmy got a 92%, and she got a 99%. Now Timmy is panicking. <laughs> He's like, what is going on? Now his classmates are really making fun of him, and he's feeling embarrassed. 
because he's used to being the smartest one in the school. So Timmy told a lie. Timmy said, well, now Timmy's angry at this point. Timmy is angry, and he just wants Sarah to just go away. He's used to being the smartest. He just wants her to leave the school. He's angry, and he tells a big lie. He tells his friends, well, I saw her cheat on the test. She took a peek at her notes. That's why she's getting these good grades. First, the students didn't believe it, but she began to get better grades. Her reports are awesome. The teachers are putting them up on the bulletin board as an example for the class. So now they're like, well, maybe she is cheating. Who can be this smart? Well, now students are beginning to avoid Sarah. They're not inviting her to sit with them at lunch. They're not picking her to play games on the, you know, during PE. They're not playing with her on the playground. How do you think Sarah is feeling? Sad. She's feeling sad. Anything else? How, else? How, how do you think she would feel? Confused. Confused? Because she didn't do anything wrong. Well, eventually it got so bad that Sarah ended up leaving the school. And Timmy got to be the smartest in the school again. The Bible says, in Proverbs chapter 4, 18, I'm sorry, verse 21. Can someone read that for me? I'm just, I'll find it quickly. Anna, can you read the first part for me? Proverbs 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. In death and life are in the power of the tongue. Did Timmy kill Sarah? How do you think? What do you think, Kendall? He doesn't know. What do you think, Michael? Did Timmy kill Sarah? Yes. Why do you think he killed her? Because he was jealous. He was jealous? Because uh, Timmy was saying mean words to her. He said mean words to her. In James chapter 3, verse 8, it says that Nobody can tame the tongue. And that it is evil and that it is full of poison. What does poison do? It, poison can kill. So the Bible is saying that our tongue can kill people? Hmm. So how many now can say that they have kept this commandment, thou shalt not murder, perfectly? Have we kept this commandment per perfectly? No. So how is it that we can tame the tongue? What can we do? Start saying nice words. Start saying nice words. Not just nice, but positive words. Positive words. Any other kind of words? No negative energy words. No negative energy words. We need to speak the truth, right? Only speak true words. Psalms 34 verse 13 says that we are to keep our tongue from evil and our lips from speaking lies. But how do we do that if we can't even tame it, right? In Psalms 144, 141 verse 3, and I'm going to have someone read it for me. Michael, can you read it for me? Yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> okay, hold on. There we go. <clears throat> okay, there we go. So Psalms chapter 41, 141, sorry, verse 3, right here. Can you read that for us? 
set a watch, O Lord, be before m my month, keep the door of the lips. Set a watch, O Lord. Thank you, Michael. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. So who is it that can guard our mouth? God can. And all we have to do is ask him to do it, and he'll do it for us. And we just have to follow his direction and his leading. Okay? So always remember that the things that we say is very powerful. It could hurt somebody, not just hurt their feelings, but it could kill their reputation, right? Okay, who can pray for us? Anna, can you pray for us? I'll pray. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for allowing us to come worship you on your Sabbath day. Dear Lord, I ask that you would set a watch over our our lips and a guard over our mouths, Lord, that we will not sin against others and against you. I ask that you would be with us this Sabbath day. Please help us to keep it holy. In Jesus' name, amen. You may go back to your seats. Okay, church, it is now time for prayer. You will find in your, your um, bulletin the congregational response sheet. The congregational response. And we are at the call to prayer. All together. Now, dear Lord, as we pray, Take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where grace does abound. May our lives be transformed by your love. May our souls be At this moment, let people everywhere join us now as we come to you in prayer. Amen. Let us petition, call on God. Not because the Father needs us, but because we need him. Could you kneel wherever you are, if possible, as we bow before the Lord our God, the one who, again, created us in his image, the one who has the power, again, to save us from all our sins, he has promised to deliver us and to give us eternity. And so we just want to praise him as we petition him in prayer. Oh, Father of heaven, we are so blessed that you have allowed us to come into your presence today to call on you because you are in the blessing business. And Lord, I just want to pray for the people around the world who are 
involved in war and civil war for the people who who, who are in the Ukraine, in the Gaza Strip. We know that you are in control and that nothing happens without you allowing it to happen. And so we pray to the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that he will stop the violence. And we know that it might not end in our lifetimes, but when Jesus comes, it will end. And so bless us while we're here, and bless us that we may do all we can to avoid that type of violence. And so as I pray that prayer, and I'm considering the violence that's going on right here in our own country. We are so politically divided, so economically divided, so socially and religiously divided. Please bring us together because this is your prayer for us. You are still in control, and we pray for the very people here at Glenville, present truth, and in the churches that are worshiping you in spirit and truth and in the beauty of holy, holiness all over the world. I'm talking about the remnant church, Lord. Lord, we pray for those on our sick and shut-in list. And something that comes to mind right away is Elder Graves. Go by his sick bed and bless him. Sister Alice Jones. Lord, we think about Elder Wesley Dunn. Bless him and keep him, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for everybody on our sick and shut-in list. Bless them as only you can. You have promised them healing. And I'm always praying for a miraculous healing, Lord, because you could do that. You could raise them from, the, from their sick bed. But regardless of what happened, comfort them, reassure their relatives, their friends, that you will give them your best. And that's good enough for me. And then, Lord, I want to pray for our speaker today as he breaks the bread of life. Oh, please, Father, hide him behind the cross so that they will see him, hear him, but really they are hearing you. The very voice of God is speaking to us today when he speaks. And, Lord, I pray that we will accept that voice. We will understand that calling. And, Lord, we will respond with obedience. We will love you enough to do your will, to glorify you, and to honor you. And, Lord, forgive us where we have missed the mark of excellence that you require of us. You've asked us to be perfect. But we have sinned against you at times without intention, and we have sinned against you sometimes deliberately. Please have mercy on us and forgive us of all our sins. Please save us. Thank you in Jesus' precious, sweet, most wonderful name. Amen. Praise the Lord from whom all blessings flow. God is good and worthy to be praised. Amen. We still have a journey to, to go. We still have paths God wants us to make. And so as these days go by, 
we praying that each and every one making their calling and election sure. I'm so glad to have my companions uh, at the prison ministry, Sandra and uh, Joseph. I'm thankful for them as faithful leaders, as guides. I have learned a lot. And I'll call uh, Joseph up in a minute because there's a lot of good things going on at the Lake Erie Institution. And it's because God is working. He don't need a thousand people. He only needs somebody that's willing. And I'm thankful for our threesome and our foursome because we got another young man. And we pray every Sunday at 9 o'clock. I look forward to the prayers. If I'm on the road, I want to be in on that prayer. Why? Because there's power in prayer. Many of you heard of Christmas behind bars. I believe uh, Brother Lemio Vega uh, heads that up. He's a friend of mine. He's a friend of Joseph. I had prayer with him Monday, and they were packing trucks, loads of goods and packages. And I've heard from inmates that said, you know what? My family left me. I felt all alone. Devil was telling me to kill myself, and I was starting to take, take the word. But I got a package, and it had treats in it. It had the word of God in it. And now I got hope. You know, I'm so thankful, and I'm going to call Joseph up, because when we go out to the Lake Erie Institution, we look to go and, 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 and give them hope. But you know, when you look in the eyes of people that's got the Holy Spirit, they give us hope. Amen. And they treat us so well. They got a choir, but I, I'm, I'm going to get back. I'm going to let Joseph say a, a few things because God is good. Yeah, we, we've, uh, we're going out to Lake Erie Correctional Institute, and that's located in Conneaut, Ohio. And my wife, Sandra, and I, and Isaiah, well, right now, Isaiah hasn't been able to go out recently. He has car problems, but uh, Elder Macklin, Sandra, and me, we go out to Lake Erie Correctional, um, Sandra and I, three times a month. We wish we could go more, but we need help. So this is a commercial for help, too. Okay. Now, when we first started going out there, it was slow going. Maybe we'd get one or two people for the Bible study, because we do the Bible study twice a month. We'd always get a big group for divine worship, right? And either I'm speaking or Elder Macklin is speaking during divine worship. And, um, but the Bible study is bas basically Sandra and me. We would go out more often, but we just don't have the help. Okay. We've gone out. God has kept the car running. God paid for that car. Right, and we're using it for a good, good cause, right? To share the gospel with those men at Lake Erie. But not only do we go out to Lake Erie, we also go out to Northeast Ohio Correctional. That's Sandra and me. Northeast. We need help. And we go there twice a month. And God has, we're still trying to get that going. But at Lake Erie Correctional, now we are getting 8, 10, sometimes 14 men coming to the study. I had the pleasure of meeting a young man, I can't call his name because we're online, who can really sing. And, 
and he blessed me with a song before I sang the last time. Beautiful voice. He's been on TV and quite unfortunately he ended up there. Okay. And but these men respect us, they love us, and we ran into some issues when we tried to establish a Seventh day Adventist church at that prison. Because that's the goal to bring people to Jesus. And we had a chaplain who was not willing to allow us to come in on the Sabbath because there were men there who really wanted to worship on the Sabbath after coming to our study. And there's still men there who want to worship on the Sabbath. So we prayed. We prayed for a chaplain, and God gave us a Seventh-day Adventist chaplain. I, is anything too hard for God? And, 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 and uh, his name is Jeffrey Ware, Dr. Jeffrey Ware, actually. Um, and he's a pastor of the Brooklyn Church and one other church not too far from here. Uh, an excellent speaker. And, and um, so we, we have Chaplain Ware. And the volunteer coordinator she was at that time, she's the former volunteer coordinator, Rachel Smith, actually said this about Chaplain Ware after he was there a few weeks. He's the best chaplain we have ever had. So now we are in a position to actually start a Seventh-day Adventist church at that prison. I mean, that's the goal. Okay. Now, we don't just do this just to be doing it. So God has richly blessed us. But again, this is a plea for help. Help us out. You know, we're trying to do it by our, just three individuals. Help us out. Help us. We're doing three prisons. I mentioned Neoc, Northeast Ohio Correctional, but also the Reintegration Center here in Cleveland. You know, whenever we can go in, we can, we can only get maybe twice a year. I think last year we only got one, one week. They had to cancel one of the weeks. So pray for us. Pray for us. Amen. Thank you, Joseph. God is good. All the time. You know you got your Bibles? Let's have another word of prayer. We simply bow our heads. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, dear Jesus and Holy Spirit, Lord, we thank you for your word. Today may it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path to guide our minds that your purposes may be accomplished in our hearts, that the message may be clear and the people will be awakened to the times in which we live. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. What a powerful children's story. Now, one day I got a, a, a message about gossip, evil surmising. I mean, it's a terrible mess. It ruins marriages, relationships, and God hates it. Sometimes we have to be awakened to the poison, because before words come out, the thoughts. Brothers and sisters, we got to watch our thoughts. Jesus told us and warned us, watch and pray. And some people take that, okay, I'll be watching my brother, see, you know, see if they got any issues. Let me check it out. No, no. <laughs> you know how we do. No, no. Watch yourself. Self. Messed up, man. I get into that. Let me let me get into the message here. Don't worry, I ain't gonna pound it for all of us. We're gonna be in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're gonna be resting there. We're gonna go to other parts of the Bible. 
John chapter 17 is a comprehensive chapter. And our study this morning comes from the 17th chapter of the book of John. God is going to speak to you through this chapter this morning. And the Spirit of God is going to touch somebody today. Amen. John, the 17th chapter, this is Jesus' great intercessory prayer. This chapter is one of the most inspiring in all the New Testaments. Before Jesus met Gethsemane's agony, before Jesus met Judas' betrayal and Peter's denial and Pilate's cowardice and Herod's skepticism and the Pharisees coldness and the Roman soldiers brutality and Satan's glee. You see before Jesus was on the cross and Gathas mountain and Calvary's hill, before Jesus there were the nails that would be driven through his hand and the spear that would wound his side, and the nails that would go through his feet, all that laid before him. And there in John chapter 17, Jesus prays for three groups. How many groups? In the first part of the prayer, he prays for himself. But very shortly, he prays for his disciples. And then shortly after that, he makes a transition. He prays for you, and he prays for me. We begin our study this morning in John chapter 17. We're going to zoom on down to verse number 1. Jesus spoke these words. The Bible says, and he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Now, every time you read in the New Testament, the hour, it is the hour of the cross. It's the hour of Gagatha's mountain. It's the hour of Calvary's hill. It's the hour that Jesus would hang between heaven and and earth is the hour of the cross. It's the hour that the nails would be driven into his flesh. And it's the hour of his betrayal. Jesus says, the hour has come. Then Jesus says something that's absolutely incredible, amazing. He says, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. I want to ask you, are you glorifying Jesus Amen. with your life? Is people in your care, do they see Christ? The hour of Christ's death on the cross of Calvary, the hour of his suffering, the hour of his pain, the hour of his agony, was the hour of his greatest glory. When you think of that, Jesus would hang between heaven and earth. He would hang as a condemned sinner, bearing the guilt of all humanity. And at that hour, the crucial hour would be the hour of the hiding of his father's face. You know, people don't realize Jesus took that for us. God has not high hid his face from us. Now, I thought that's going to be more painful than hell fire. We have, he never departed from us. Even wicked people, he still let the sun shine. But when in that time he departed from the Son of God and Jesus had to cry out, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm your son. Why are you forsaken me? It's that hour 
that would be the hour of the darkest darkness surrounding him. You know, uh, it's a big, it's a big uh, stir from Texas all the way to Ashtabu, going into Pennsylvania, April the 8th, eclipse. People are coming from miles around. Last one was 1806. You and I will not see another eclipse. But by the grace of God, we will experience the dark day. That's going to be more darker than what happened to Egypt. It's coming, brothers and sisters. But the hour that Jesus hung on the cross was darkness. The sins of all humanity rested upon him, that is, the Son of God. And when Jesus Christ hung on the cross, he felt in his very being, in his physical flesh, he felt in his very heart and mind the condemnation of ev that every sinner who is lost will feel. And lost for all eternity. He felt that. He took it. He took the blow for you and I. It was not the nails through his hands that gave him the most pain. It was not the sparing of his sins of all humanity. And he tasted death for every human being. He felt the pains of what it would be like for millions, literally millions of people who would be lost. He felt that lostness. The scripture says the hour, that hour, he would look death in the face. He would triumph and conquer. And that would be the hour of his greatest glory. Are you with me today? His hour of greatest suffering was the hour of his greatest glory. And there are times that the hour of our greatest suffering, there are times of the hour of our greatest trials, there are times in the hour of our greatest difficulties and greatest challenges are the hours, brothers and sisters, of our greatest glory, and we sometimes don't realize it. We have our pity pop party. Because in those hours, when we recognize our utter inability to deal with the situation that God comes through in powerful ways for his glory's sake. It is in those moments of ap our absolute weakness that God reveals his absolute strength. That's why we're here today. And we look back at Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, all oh, that little bit, the Lord brought you through. He brought us through, and he's getting us strengthened for the week to come. It is not the avoidance of problems or challenges and difficulty that brings glory to God. It is facing them in the name of Christ. It is concerning them or looking at them and scrutinizing them through his power and overcoming them by his grace. You know, I, I, we, we need to focus on that because nobody's going to get into heaven and you haven't over, we haven't overcome. There is overcoming power in Christ. And we got to establish what is God's voice and what is the devil's voice. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 says, There are many spirits that are going out into the world. 
many spirits. Look at it. Look at it with me. There are many spirits that are going out into the world. We ain't at no rodeo. We're in a battle. We have our pity parties. Oh, nobody speaks to me. Oh, they won't do this for me. Oh, they cry babies. And if we don't say nothing to nobody, we're crying in our hearts. And if we don't watch it, it comes out of our lips and we stain somebody. Chapter 4, verse John, chapter 4, beloved, believe not every spirit. Don't you know that, that, that Satan knows he's, he's crazy now? Why? Because his time is short. Why is this happening to me? You say, we in a battle. Beloved, believe not every spirit. I'm talking right now, and you got to understand, sometimes he uses people that are not of Christ. That's those spirits, and they come by, and we need to love them. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. A lot of people have left already. They left because they go to the internet, and you know the devil got stuff on the Adventist church on the internet. Why you believe in that junk? And then they don't go to any church. I'm going to get to that later. Hereby, verse 2, we know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus, that Jesus is come into the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is not of God. You know, they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to be preaching the word because they don't know God. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. It's already in the world. The Bible says, where have you have heard of it should come, and even now it's already into the world. We're in a battle, and we need to know the word. Go back to John chapter 17. So we're challenged. Do you ever, we ever thank God? Lord, thank you for those trials this week. Done me good. Because if we're on velvet carpet, nothing happening to us. Uh, then we are, we are really in trouble. See? God, it's the devil messing with us. Thank God he's messing with us because we must be on the right side. Now Jesus prayed for four things in John chapter 17. When we come to the prayer of Christ, disciples, he prays first that they would not and they would be not, would not be guarded. He didn't pray that they would be guarded or protected. He didn't pray that. He prayed, secondly, that they would be sanctified. He prayed, thirdly, that they would be glorified. So let's look at the four things that Jesus prayed for. And what did Jesus pray for in the garden so long ago, 2,000 years ago? What did Jesus pray on that night? What was when what is Jesus praying for now? He's praying what he's prayed for then. He's praying for now. Just give me just a little bit more on the on the He says you are in his mind. Then back in Gagatha in the Garden of Gethsemane, and you are in his mind now. What he was seeking God for then, he appears before the judgment bar of God for you now. Praise God. Thank you. Amen. What a difference a mic make. They say what a difference a day make. What a, what a difference a mic make. All right, praise God from whom all blessings flow. So John chapter 17, 
First of all, let's zoom on down to verse 6 of John chapter 17, but we will concentrate on verse 11. Right now in verse number 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And they have kept thy word. You know, if the disciples have kept his word, we can keep his word. Soon, as Jesus prayed, he seeks the Father and he says, they were yours. They were not mine. The glorious reality is this, brothers and sisters. Whatever you go through in life, you are Christ. When you come to Jesus, you become a son or daughter of God. Amen. He holds you in his hands. And Jesus says in verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and thou hast received them, and have surely known that I have come out of thee, and they have believed that thou didst set me. Verse 9. I pray for them. Jesus is praying. He is not thinking about the nails through his hands. He's not thinking about the crown of thorns upon his head. He's not thinking about Judas' betrayal or Peter's denial or the Jews' rejection or the Roman crucifixion. He's not thinking about the disciples that will forsake him and run away. He is thinking about you, and he's thinking about me in the hour of his greatest suffering. He says, I pray for them, verse 9, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are yours. Now notice verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep them. Keep them through thy own name, those who thou hast given me, that they may be one. Talking about unity now, come on that they may be one as we are one. So Jesus is going to leave soon. He will ascend to heaven, and soon he will be out of sight of the earth and inside of heaven. Soon the disciples will no longer visibly see him anymore. What is Jesus' concern? Now notice, Jesus didn't pray that his disciples would be taken out of the world. Christianity does not release us from our problems. It provides the wisdom and strength to solve them. Christianity does not offer us a life in which problems are escaped. It offers us a life in which problems are faced and conquered. That's what it's about. We're in a battle. I get it, got it, got to get it. Christianity does not offer us a life of ease. It offers us a life of triumph. Warfare. We're in a battle. We are in a battle between good and evil. We are in a battle between, between Christ and Satan. And the Apostle Paul puts it this way. Keep your finger on John chapter 17. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 22. Jesus never prays that his disciples would be taken out of the world. Some people think that Christianity is peace. 
and joy all the time. There is an inner peace, yes. We were talking about that, Sandy. It was an inner peace. He strengthened us in the inner man. Let me get into the word. Come on, get into the word. It's a, it's a joy in a struggle because we, again, are in a battle. We are on the enemy's land. So if you're going through a struggle, if you're going through a battle, if you are facing the wiles, what does that mean? Wiles? What is that? No, that means tricks. The devil is tricky. He is subtle. And he's a liar. The tricks of the enemy don't become discouraged. Come on now, you be honest with you that you'd be discouraged. Somebody look around and we're pitter-pattering. God says, stand up. You know, when I, when I find the imps coming on me, and they love that, they come on Joseph, they come on Sand. Why? Because we, they're soul winners, and they're soul winners up in here. Don't be surprised if the imps come on you. Get your mind out of watch the basketball game. Quit having studies with that. You know, they're going to try to distract you. Instead of you going to your worship time when you get up in the morning, we want you to get a, 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 plate of, a plate of pancakes. Get your mind focused. I got to get to Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm telling the truth. Everything that, you know, I, now out in the country, you know, you can't get away. The birds try to distract. You know, I love to hear the birds. But then you, the Satan will hit one, they want to knock on the window. What you knocking on the window for? He knocking there. Give me some peanuts. I'm hungry. You better get some of them worms. Get some bite on some of them. You know, laughter is good for the heart, isn't it? I'm telling y'all the truth. Here I come. In the country, all kind of animals come by. Remember with the cold back there, we single degree. Oh, uh, I'm telling you the truth. Turkey buzzer come. You know us turkey buzzer got to stay close to the mic. He spread his wing. He was right close to my car. I said, Lord, what do you, well, should I go in the house and get some ketchup and mustard? Because he, you know, they, they, do I look like a drumstick to him? And you know, generally, I'm telling you the truth. It was too cold to get my thing, and they ain't going to believe me to take a picture. He's near my car under the face. I guess he's trying to get some shelter. You know, sometimes sometime animals come to tell you, man, help me. So uh, he, he kind of got to the back of my car. You went to the back of my Jeep. I got to go back there. So I, now I, I walk slowly so he don't think I'm trying to do anything. It was a pretty bird. He had a nice uh, orange beak. And when he stretched out, it was from that last flower all the way over here. Man, he, wow, he had to dry his wing, do something. But he, and I got too close, he went. <laughs> now, why did I get on that? I don't know. We learn a lot from nature. One day, I'm resting. And I know a deer do not rub against the house. I said, what is that? And the angel said, why don't you get up and look? I said, nah, you know, the, you know. So it snowed that morning. When I went out and I saw tracks, a lot of tracks like that. And I know we ain't got no elephants up in here. It was a bear. And I always wanted to see a bear. I said, Lord, let me see a bear. That was my opportunity. I didn't see, I saw the track. I said, yeah, you slept, and I told you to get up. You could have said, well, wait a minute. And he destroyed my, my bird feeder. So God is good. But we're in a battle. And I know we're in a battle. But sometimes we forget we are in a battle. Where we at? Ephesians chapter 6 Verse 12, the Bible says, for we wrestle not. Wrestle what? Not against flesh and blood. The brother or sister is not your enemy. And we, we be praying, we thinking, oh, I wish he'd get run over by a truck. That's how we are. 
We need to be praying for that brother or sister. They need to see Christ. Lord, forgive them. Where they are weak, help them to be strong. For we wrestle, and, and, and we get to get this in our minds, because the battle is in our minds. For we wrestle not against human beings, but against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's a battle, there's a struggle, the devil is a vicious foe, and a deadly battle rages. Jesus never prayed that his followers would find escape. He prayed that they would find victory. How did you notice that, that in John chapter 17? Look at verse 11. We need to go back to it. Notice the words that Jesus prays in this first part of his prayer. John chapter 17, verse 11. Jesus prays, and now, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. He's crying, he's praying to his father. And I come to thee, holy father. Keep those whom thou hast given me. Keep, brothers and sisters. It's a very interesting word. Keep those. That word keep, it has the impression of the word guard it. Guard them, O Lord. It has the impression of protect them. Jesus prays. He commits his followers to his Father's care. So every Christian can claim the keeping power of God. God will never allow us to go through any test that he does not hold us in his hand. You know, many years ago, this is a true story, many years ago, the Native American Indians had a very unique practice of training their young warriors. When these young warriors were 13 years old, they had been trained in tracking they have been trained in scouting. They have been trained in hunting. And they have been trained in fishing. And on the 13th birthday of one of these young Indian braves, the young brave was brought out. He was brought at night out into the woods. He was brought miles and miles into the woods, five, six, seven, eight miles into the deepest, darkest, dense forest. And he was left there to spend all night alone in the forest. Every cracking twig brought fear to this young brave's heart. Every squirrel that ran up a tree brought fright to this young brave. And it seems like eternity. And as he stood there, you see the young brave was blindfolded when he was brought there. And the blindfold was taken off. And he was left alone. He has spent all night there. That was his initiation into adulthood. And he visualized wild animals ready to pounce on him. And throughout the night, he was terrified. It appeared that the night would never end. It appeared like it was eternity. But when the dawn broke, and the first light through the interior of the forest came tweaking in. Looking around, the, bo the boy saw flowers and trees and an outline of a path. 
Then, to his utter astonishment, he saw a man standing a few feet from him. It was his father with a bow and arrow standing guard over that young prey all night long. We're coming to some very frightful times. The news frightens sometimes us. And I wouldn't look at it before you go to bed. You might have a nightmare. But God has got us. This church has went through some devastating times. We lost one pastor. Then we lost a second pastor. The next one was snatched. And another one was gone. And then we got one and we got real comfortable. And we hear the word, he's going to be gone. So we're strong. And I thank God for the post that have kept this church floating. Not only the board, but individuals by the grace of the Holy Spirit that has stayed at their post. God is coming for those that are hanging in there. Sure, there are some that had weak knees and they're gone. Two or three have to take on responsibilities. But when the going gets tough, the tough go to Jesus. When I say tough, I'm talking about weak. Me and Jose, we wear these t-shirts at the Ashtabula County Fair. Matter of fact, that's coming up. <laughs> and, uh, it, 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 you know, uh, we was out. Me and Jose was out passing out tracks one day. I think Anthony was leading us out. And he said, yeah, Brother Ron, you, you, you thunder, and, I, and I, I'm lightning. I said, man, I got to talk to that boy. And then, you know, it wasn't then, you know, it, I understand it. But, uh, you know, after a few weeks, a month or so, we have a Bible study. No, we ain't, we ain't, we ain't no lightning. <laughs> and we sure ain't no thunder. I'm weak and you're, you're feeble. No, no, I, I, I'll be feeble. We all, we all messed up. You don't believe that? Go to, go to Revelation chapter 3. See, when we think we something, we ain't nothing. Apostle Paul said, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God is good. So God keeps us. Let's do a little, let's do a little uh, side study here. Our side study, and you all know it, but for the new ones, we have three enemies. Don't never forget it. We have how many enemies? We have three. The first one is Satan. The Bible says, you can write it down, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. That's what he does. He does that in pleasure. And we see the world as it is now, seeking whom he may devour down just a little bit. Thank you, KK. So Satan is number one. The world is number two. First John chapter two, verse 15, 16, and 17. That's why the Bible said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know, that's frightening when you think about it. Get attached to this world. For why? why? He didn't say the people. He said the world. What's in the world? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh. A lot of our young people, and we're still praying. It's because we had a big prayer last week. We're still praying for our young people, praying for our families. Why? Because the internet has devastated them. They can't see because the God of this world has blinded them. 
all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life is not of the Father, but it's of the world. And the world that should frighten us will pass away. Well, anybody attached to it is passing away too. And the lust thereof, but he that does us the will of God abides forever. But didn't I say we, we got three enemies? The devil, the world. What's the third? Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. And we need to have a hard look. Jesus says, Jesus said, watch. I ain't got time to watch my brother. I got time to uplift my brother because he uplifts me. And I uplift him. And we uplift the brethren, whether it's 50 or 60, standing before us. And, and I tell you, I can barely get through the sermon when you see Christian brethren and they don't even look like they're in prison. We're in church. The flesh, watch out for your own self. Jeremiah chapter 17, 9 and 10, the heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You can't know it. Can't quit patting yourself on the back. The I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to the fruit of his doings. So a good prayer, because we should be afraid of ourselves, is Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Lord, search my heart. Search my heart and try me. See, we, sometimes we don't want to do that. But God will show sure enough try you. And we need to be tried. We need to ask him to try us. What? I didn't know I was like, yeah, you are. Why? Because the heart is deceitful above all things. Desperately wicked. We need to pray for our young people. Why? Because people are looking for escapism. The drunkard would go, to his, would go to his whiskey. But youth and people run to escapism. That is the television world, the internet, the tendency to escape from the daily reality. Why? Because they're not praying. Reality or ritual, indulging in daydreaming, fast, fat, you know, fascinating or entertainment. It's really, really, it's really crazy. And they need prayer. I'm thankful for any youth that come into this church. I'm immediately on their, I'm, I'm on their side. Just talked to the mother uh, a little briefly of, of, our, of our young man that came in today. We gotta stick with them. Sooner than we realize. So the word keep has the impression of guarded. And so the Lord protects us, looks after us, and he sends angels. So brothers and sisters, as we continue with our study. In the scriptures, the Bible says that we are never far from the Father's eyes. Never what? Far from the Father's eyes. Even in the darkest night, we tremble with fear. He is there. He is on guard to protect us, to preserve us, and to guide us. And we can have absolute confidence that not only did Jesus pray for us in John chapter 17, but Jesus is praying for us right now. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Let's go to chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7. 
And let's zoom on down to verse 25. We have a friend in the heavenly courts, and that friend is praying for us, and your name is on his lips today, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Notice that the scripture says Jesus prays for us in the garden that night. And he's praying for us now, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. It says, wherefore? Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. That come, that's that key word, we got to come. Spend time coming with, to God. Come unto me, he says, all ye that labor and are heavy late, I will give you rest. Come unto him, or to God by him, seeing he what? Ever liveth to make intercession. What does Jesus do? He ever lives. What does he ever live to do? To make intercession for us. Notice. He is in heaven making intercession for you right now. And he says he's able to save to the uttermost. So when we're giving up, Jesus doesn't give up. What Jesus is able to do, he's able to save how much? He's making intercession for you, brothers and sisters. He's making intercession for you, child of God. Let's make it a little bit more simple. Here's what it means, the intercession of Christ in the sanctuary above simply means that Jesus is doing everything for you that you need for salvation. In Christ, forgiveness is ours. It's abundant. In Christ, freedom from guilt is ours. Victory over sin is ours, and in Christ, strength to overcome is ours. In Christ, hope for the future is ours. We can rejoice. We can rejoice that everything we need for salvation is ours in Christ. The intercessory of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary simply means that through Christ, all heaven's blessings flow from the throne of God to us today. Forgiveness flows, freedom flows, guilt flows, freedom from condemnation flows, strength flows, wisdom flows. All of those gifts are yours because of the intercession of Almighty God in the second person of the Godhead. Now notice something pretty significant. Who is it that is praying for you? And you know it's one thing for your husband to pray for you. It's one thing for a wife to pray for you. And praise God for that. It's one thing for a friend to pray for you. But when Christ is praying for you, that is something. That is deep. It's a different function. It grabs our attention. Notice in the Bible. Matter of fact, uh, Matthew reveals some, something very interesting. He reveals the sermons of Christ interfacing with humanity. Luke is part of the parables of Christ. And it's the story of Christ as a physician in the story of the parable. It was written to show the, the divinity of Christ. And when you come to John 17, it presupposes that you understand who it is that is praying for you. In John chapter 1, the title of Christ are introduced. So let's go to John chapter 1, and we are going to breeze on down through John chapter 1, and we get the significance of what it means that Jesus is praying for us. John chapter 1 introduces the whole idea of who is the living Christ. Verse 1, in the beginning. 
in the what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So who is it that is praying for us? He is the one, the Almighty, the Eternal One, that who coexisted with God the Father. Let your eyes drop on down to verse number three. Who is it that is praying for you? Verse three, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. Who is it that praying for you? He is the all-powerful creator. And the world came into existence. He is the one who spoke to the earth. And the earth was carpeted with the living green grass. And then the stars appeared, and the sun and the moon. Who is it that praying for you? Verse 4, in him was life. You know, I, I, that just, it boggles my mind. Life, walking around among us. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. He is the one who lights your heart. He is the one who lights my heart. He is the one who lights every heart that is born into this world. And by his Holy Spirit, it begins to dawn to himself. Who is it that is praying for you? Look at verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received. And grace for grace. Who is it that's praying for you? He is the fountain of grace. He is the fountain of truth. Who is it that's praying for you? No man, it says in verse 18. No man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. That word begotten means unique one. The one who is one of a kind. It comes from the Greek mono, meaning one. Why is he one of a kind? He existed with the Father. That is forever, for eternity. Who is it that is praying for you? He is the one who is God. He is the one who is the creator. He is the one who lights every man that comes into the world. He is the one who exercises all things throughout eternity. He is the one is the fountain of grace and truth. And your name is on his list. John chapter 1, verse 29. Who is it that prays for you the next day? John sees Jesus coming and says unto him, Behold, look out, pay attention, pay attention. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. I got to ask you today, are you letting him take away your sin? Are you still the same way? Who is it that is praying for you? It's the one who died for you. He's praying for you. John chapter 1, verse 49. Who is it that is praying for you? Nathaniel answered and says unto him, Rabbi, thou art the son of God. Thou art the king of Israel. When we sense this, we sense that it's almighty God. And he knew Nathaniel when he was under that tree. And that, that got Nathaniel's attention. Christ is praying for us. It is Jesus who has never lost a battle with Satan yet. It is Christ who has triumphed over Satan in his life. And also, he's triumphed over death. It is the crucified, ascended, resurrected, and interceding, coming again, Lord, that is praying for us. How can we be 
discouraged. Oh, yeah, for a little while, for a little second, sure. And we do. When we see children getting murdered, when we see people losing their house or losing life, we get sad. But inside, we still have that joy. Jesus is praying for us. Now, the second aspect of Jesus praying is found in John chapter 17, verse 16 and 17. First, he prays that he will be kept, protected, guarded by the power of God. Now, the second thing he prays for is that we will be sanctified by his grace. John chapter 17, 15 and 16, notice what it says. He says, I pray not that they should take them out of the world, but that they should keep them from evil. It was not Jesus' prayer that we should live in some monastery away from people, and, and we, some of us do that. I just and you know, and then it'll be time for prayer meeting. It'll be time for church, and here I come. We have nothing to be afraid of. But how can we be kept from evil of the world? Look at verse 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Here Jesus sanctifies. And what does sanctify mean? Sanctify means set apart. Sanctify means to make holy. There's a word used in the Old Testament of the priests of Israel. They were set apart, and the truth of God's word sets us apart. It sanctifies or cleanses us in the inner soul. God, to God be the glory. What we were 10 years ago, a year ago, we're not like that today. Some, we come into the church, and some don't wake up right away. As the word of God gets in them, they start waking up. And that's a good thing. Notice Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, talking about the inner soul. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Now, when Jesus uses the word world, what does that mean? If you look at the Gospel of John, there are four things about the world. Jesus says they are not of the world. What does that mean? They are not of the culture of this world. What is the teaching of John regarding the world? There are four things about it. First, the world is polluted. It seeks meaning where meaning is not. It seeks for purpose where purpose is not. It seeks for pleasure where pleasure is not. In the word of God, we find reality. We find what? It reveals a loving God who cares, and then there's the power to change our lives. And when we are saturated, when we saturate our minds with the word of God, we can sing with West John Wesley, I once was blind, but now I see. God is good. All the time, God is good. Brothers and sisters, we have not come to the crux of John chapter 17 yet. But the Bible says, secondly, the world is deceived. The word of God speaks to us. It opens our mind, that blindness in the world. Thirdly, the world is a dangerous place according to John's gospel. 
is filled with temptations of Satan. Daily we are bombarded by those temptations that are, can easily overwhelm us. There are warning in John chapter 1, 1 John cha chapter 2, and we already read it before. It says for us to not to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world are what? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. It is not of the Father. And Jesus is saying in John chapter 17, I'm praying. Don't let my people be bombarded with the dangers of the world. Saturate their minds, dear Father, with your word so that they can see a new reality. The world is dangerous. Fourthly, the Gospel of John, the world is defiled. It's spiritually fallen. It's corrupt. It's wicked to the core. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, as we saturate our minds with the Word of God, we are cleansed. Take your Bible. Turn to James. James chapter 1. Notice what it says. Because we have some 14 billion brain cells or more in our brains. And I never counted them, but we, it's pretty close. James chapter 1. And when you read the word of God, the brain cells get transformed and the living word enters the mind and cleanses the inner recesses of the brain. Notice James chapter 1, verse 21. What is Jesus praying? He's praying that his people would be not so busy as to study his word, not so involved with making a living that they forget to make a life. He's praying that the world would not be so encroached into our thinking process that we spend many seconds reading without reading the Word of God. And many hours in front of the TV set. He's praying that we would not be so busy to have that transformation of the brain cells in our mind to the living Word. Notice what the Bible says. James chapter 1. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easily to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Let the word of God speak to your heart. Jesus is praying for us, brothers and sisters. He's praying that we make it because he wants to be us to be where he is. Jesus says that the church should be unified. He prays for that. And notice the prayer of Jesus. The reason that unity is crucial to you and I and to the mission and to the witness of the church that the world would see a church that is dealing with conflict and is still unified. That the world, see, is defined. The world is defined by broken relationships. The world is defined 
for dysfunctional families. The world is defined by fractured relationships in nearly non-existent communities. And if the church can reveal the loving unity of Christ, it would be a sign to the world that God is at work and that no human effort can accomplish it. The love that we are to show to the world is, and listen, this is very important. The love we are to show to the world is to mirror the love that the Father has for the Son. That's why I'm still here, kicking me out. I don't care what happens. God put you here for a purpose. And when we see Christ in many of you, we see it. To show forth Christ's image. God is coming back for his church. He's coming back for you. It is to mirror the love that the father has for his son. Now again, notice John chapter 17. We start with the verse 20. Jesus prays, I do not pray for these alone, but for those who, be who believe in me through your word. That you, that's you, that's me. Jesus is praying that they all might be one as you, Father, and me, and I, and you, that they may be one in us. Now, notice, he goes on to pray that the world might believe that you sent me. And notice the essence of the unity of the church. When people with different ideas, when people with different cultures, when people with different backgrounds get together, they express themselves on a committee in a different opinions, but in love and respect for one another. When we have differences of backgrounds and unity, it is not everybody dressing the same or eating the same or thinking the same. Unity is a bondness that we have in Christ. It's recognition that we are the sons and daughters of Christ. Some time ago, now listen to this, because I want the young people and those that are, you know, you say, I don't really understand. Well, you're gonna understand this. Some time ago, I heard an amusing story. I don't know if it was true or not. It probably wasn't. And here's the story. A man is on a boat traveling on the ocean. And as he's traveling through the ocean, he is alone. And a, a storm comes up. And the storm overwhelms the boat. And the guy swims and he goes on this little island. It's a, it's a marooned island. It is one of these islands where nobody lives. So the first thing he does, he builds a hut. He builds a what? He gets together some twigs and branches and a little grass, and he builds this hut. And then he builds another hut, Joe Davis. Then he builds another hut. He builds three huts and nobody on the island except him. A year go by, two years goes by, and he's the only one on that island, and pretty soon a boat comes by. It's a rescue boat, and the rescue boat rescues the guy. But they see three huts, and they thought somebody else lived on the hut besides this one person. And the captain of the rescue boat said, what are these huts for? 
And the man said, oh, the first one over there, that, that's where I live. Well, what about those other two huts, he says. Well, I had to worship. I had to worship God. So that's a church. I built a church on that second one. And the captain says, praise God. What's the other one for? The other one is the church I used to go to. I think you get it. Get a get it. Get a got it. Brothers and sisters, as I come to a close, God is coming back again. He's coming back for his people. And he wants us to be in his hand. 2,000 years ago, he was thinking on that night. Jesus is in the sanctuary. He's in the most high. And he's praying, Father, I desire you. I desire you. I desire you. And then the judgment comes up. And there are names that come up before the judgment. Angels are hushed. Cherubims and seraphims are quiet. All of heaven is quiet. Your name comes up before the judgment. And as it does, Christ praying for you in the garden. And he stands and he says, Father, I desire that this my child be with me throughout eternity. And this and all of heaven says, it is enough. The sacrifice of Christ, it is enough. The blood that flowed from his hands are enough. The forgiveness that flowed from the cross is enough. Is enough save in God's kingdom forever. And all of heaven begins to sing, worthy, worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive riches, honor, and glory. And Jesus prayed for you 2,000 years ago. He prayed that you would be kept in his love. He prayed that you would be sanctified by his word. He prayed that your heart would be in unity with others around you. And he prayed that you, 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 all of us, would be, would be saved. The Father will answer the Son's prayer for you. Walk through life filled with hope. Walk through life filled with encouragement. The battle wages. All the demons of hell cannot take you from the hands of Christ. His prayer for you will be answered. Brothers and sisters, let hope fill your heart. Let hope fill your heart. God bless you if we have that closing song, Sister O'Sullivan. Please rise, take your hymnals. Hymn number 214, We Have This Hope, 214. All together. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope in the coming of the Lord. We have this 
this faith that Christ alone imparts. Faith in the promise of his word. We believe the time is here when the nations far and near shall awake and shout and sing hallelujah christ is king we have this hope that burns within our hearts hope in the coming of the lord we are united in jesus christ our lord we are united in his love we <laughs> people of the world people who need our savior's love let's sing it out Soon the heavens will open wide. Christ will come to claim his bride. All the universe will sing. Hallelujah, Christ is King. We have this hope, this faith in God's great love. We are united in Christ. You may be seated. I want to ask you a question. Who pays your bills? You might say, you might say, my husband, my wife, or we do it together. But let me ask the same question this way. Who do you get the money from to pay your bills? <laughs> Amen. Who do you get the money from to pay for the clothes you wear every day? The food you eat. To pay the rent to stay where you're living. Who protects you while you sleep in your bed at night at that place? And, uh, you know, and, and somebody may say, okay, my employer, the government pays me for current employment and past employment. But your prayer could be, your, your prayer could be a private company. The city, the county, the state, or the federal government. And, and, and as Gail was saying, the one who pays all our bills is bigger and greater than all these institutions. He is God indeed. You're right. And when Jesus shed his own blood for our sins at Calvary, he paid the highest price possible to save us from our sins. It didn't cost us anything, but it cost him more than we could ever comprehend. And he's the same God who told the sun where to stand in the morning. I like Nicole Mullins, the way she said that. He's the same God who told the ocean you can only come this far. He's the same God who can catch a falling star. The same God who created us in his image and has the power to recreate us. I'm talking about God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And even all the good angels who are there to help us whenever we need their yeah, help. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. And that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now. Herewith, said the Lord of hosts, 
if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I thought he was in position to come down there. Jump the gun a little bit there. Okay. Sorry, sorry I can't uh, sing today because I have to be at the nursing home by 2 o'clock. Just over 45 minutes away. And uh, uh, maybe next time, you know. Uh, yes, but we have a nursing home ministry in, in addition to our prison ministry. And uh, my wife and I, we need help there too. <laughs> Going in every Sabbath. So bring you all the time into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now here with says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for a life of blessings. And we can only get those blessings from you. And we thank you most of all for eternal life. Bless those who gave and those who could not give. My prayer is that these funds will go toward the spreading of the gospel near and far. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Whatever it may be, all that we have is thine, O oh Lord. A trust, O oh Lord, from thee. Let us bow our heads for our benediction. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, love, and mercy. And Lord, we ask that you, that you, that you just keep us, Lord, because we cannot keep ourselves. And Lord, we pray for those on the line and everyone in the sound of my voice. We pray, Lord, that happiness will be at our door. May it knock early and may it stay late and may it leave God's peace, love, joy, and good health behind. We ask all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Be blessed. God bless you. God keep you. Praise the Lord.